like to call this uh, February 19, 2008, meeting of Middletown City Council to order. If you join me for a moment of meditation and a pledge of allegiance to the flag. Brewster. Here. Mr. Becker. Here. Ms. Ford. Here. Ms. Scott Jones. Present. Mr. Marconi. Present. Mr. Mulligan. Here. Mr. Schiavone. Here. Okay. Thank you. Uh, this evening we have a, a special um, certificate of recognition we want to present to one of our Middletown citizens. If I could invite Mr. Horace Fuller to the uh, podium here and uh, Ms. Ford to join me for the pre presentation, please. Absolutely. to uh, take a moment to recognize Mr. Horace Fuller for uh, really duty above and beyond uh, <clears throat> the steps of an average citizen. He stepped in last uh, year uh, to save the life of a, a two-year-old who was uh, involved in a pit bull attack and uh, stepped in and uh, really um, prevented a serious accident from getting much worse. And we wanted to recognize his efforts here with a certificate of, of recognition. So uh, he resides in uh, Miss Ward's, or, or Miss uh, Ford's ward, and, um, <laughs> and it was straight here, Ford's ward, um, and, uh, and, and, and living in the second ward. It's important that we see citizens step up and, and get involved. And we wanted to uh, recognize Mr. Fuller for that. So with that, I'll read the uh, certificate that we present him this evening. Whereas, congratulations and citations are in order for Horace Fuller for saving the life of a two-year-old Middletown girl. And whereas, catastrophe was avoided because of the skillful and quick response to danger and knowledge of life-saving demonstrated by Mr. Fuller. And whereas, this courageous action in averting what could have been a tragic loss to family, friends, and community was an act of heroism which deserves special recognition by the governing body of this city. Now therefore, be it resolved that the sincere appreciation of the City Council, City Administration, and all the citizens at large of this community are hereby extended to Mr. Horace Fuller for this heroic action. Thank you. Thank you. As a second ward of uh, city councilwoman, I would just like to um, personally um, thank you for your considerable um, bravery and heroism in this regard. Um, you are a source of pride not only for the second ward, but for the city of Middletown. So I would like to thank you very much, Mr. Fuller. Thank you. Yes. Okay, and with that, we have a uh, public hearing uh, this evening uh, for the uh, CDBG and home program for the city of Middletown. Mr. Kohler. Mayor and Council. This is the annual action plan for our HUD program for the CDBG and home programs. Uh, every five years, uh, we submit a consolidated plan to HUD, which is a five-year strategy for the use of these funds, and this is the fourth year under our current consolidated plan. The consolidated is an actual an uh, annual action plan, and we tell HUD, based on our entitlement grants, how we plan to program those funds to meet their statutory goals, and that is to provide decent housing, suitable living environment, and expand economic opportunities. This year's program will include six main activities, being housing revitalization, public services, 
housing code enforcement, neighborhood revitalization, economic development, and grants management. I have a series of slides in this presentation which I'm going to skip through very quickly dealing with all the eligible and ineligible uh, activities under the program. I realize we had covered that under our last uh, presentation that we had, our last public hearing about a month ago. As we noted in that, uh, that the CDBG funding has been decreasing steadily. Uh, City Council did uh, write a letter of support to Congress asking for continued funding of this program. Uh, the annual action plan, uh, let me get down to the bottom line, which I know you want to see. The sources of funding under this program is from our CDBG entitlement grant. This year we will be receiving $670,092. On the home grant, we are a partner with Butler County to receive those dollars, and our share of that Butler County consortium is $370,000. Other funds, which are local matching funds and prior year funds that came in under budget, is $521,000. And then we also have a housing rehabilitation revolving loan fund. That's where we actually do home improvement loans to homeowners. Those funds are paid back to the city and then are made available for relending. And we anticipate about $400,000 of paid back funds to be available. For a total program of $1,961,092. The proposal for the expenditure of those funds are number one, housing revitalization for $1,170,000. And under that housing revitalization, we would do down payment and closing cost assistance, comprehensive housing rehabilitation. Those are the home improvement <coughs> loans I was speaking of. The home repair program, which is an emergency home repair grant to low-income homeowners and community housing improvements and program delivery costs for that $1,170,000. Under public services, it's uh, continued funding of the city's uh, social health center at Ninth and Yankee, the continuance of our city's fair housing program, and the lifespan home buyer education counseling. And the total expenses for that is uh, $70,000. Under housing code enforcement, uh, we have the uh, delivery costs and also the legal aid cost of providing assistance to the community to enforce our minimum property maintenance standards. And that amount is $190,000. Um, under uh, neighborhood revitalization, we have property and demolition clearance. Uh, and program delivery costs and the Douglas Park revitalization. Those total $336,000. As you saw at uh, last month's meeting, we had programmed of that $336,000, $100,000 for demolition. We noted that that is a very light figure for what we would like to be able to fund. And uh, in speaking with our, our staff, we believe that if some of our other projects come in under cost, that all of those cost savings we will probably transfer to that demolition item and, and try to bolster that program. <clears throat> Under economic development, we continue our downtown commercial facade loan program and those uh, project delivery costs for a total of $60,000 and then the grants management for $135,092. Total expenditures being $1,961,092, which matches our resources. This is a public hearing. We do anticipate uh, submission of this on or about March 17th for the program year, which starts May 1st. And we can also receive public comments up until the submission time, and we will make sure that those comments are forwarded to HUD. Okay. Any questions Thank regarding you. the program? Any questions of Mr. Kohler? No. Okay. Since this is a uh, public hearing, uh, I will ask for anyone that wants to speak against our proposal for the Community Development Block Grant and Home Projects. Anyone that wants to speak against the plan? 
Okay, is anyone out there that would like to speak in favor of our plan for community development block grants or home funds? Um, hello. <laughs> Thank you. If you'd state your name and address for the record, please. It's Jerry Lynn Maples, 3200 Barber Drive. Good evening. <laughs> um, it's good to see you all again. <laughs> um, I just came down to um, speak on behalf of the down payment assistance program and the home buyer classes that um, have been started this year. Um, I personally have been able to use this um, for my clients and I just wanted to come down and kind of speak on, on behalf of that. It is a great, great tool and actually I have two buyers right now, a couple, who doesn't live in Middletown currently but they will be in the foreseeable future as soon as um, the husband decides on what house. The wife likes the house, but the, but the husband don't. <laughs> but when they come to terms, they are going to be moving, so that's going to be a, a whole family right here in Middletown just on that, and they actually are going to the home buyer classes for February. Um, so it, it is exciting. Um, I just kind of wanted to point out a couple different things of the benefit-wise. Um, Recently, in the past, we have been using um, Nehemiah for down payment, which actually is um, coming out of the seller's funds. So, so by using this program, it, it not only helps the buyers, but it helps the sellers also, because that's money that, that they are going to be not, not losing. So that, that is a, a great tool, and um, I just I really am in favor of it. I, I'm excited about it. It is a positive thing for Middletown and it's going to really, really help not only promote ownership for homes, but it's going to definitely help bring new new citizens to the city. So I just wanted to come down here and share that with you okay. and let you know I like it and I'm using it. I have my first loan closing with it on Thursday, so, so it's great. Great. Good to hear. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else to speak in favor of our CDBG or home plan? Seeing none, we'll declare this public hearing closed. And any other further discussion or comments from council? Okay. Uh, with that, we have another public hearing on our HUD annual action plan. Mr. Kohler. This is somewhat of a continuation of the previous discussion, although it's a separate action. In our previous 2007 program year, uh, we had budgeted a substantial amount of our home funds through the Butler County Consortium to be used for new housing development. Uh, this is, uh, the amount was $243,700. The anticipation of the use of that funds was something similar to what we did in the Maple Park Square, where uh, the city partnered with a private nonprofit to actually redevelop an infill housing site uh, and, and introduce new housing product in an existing neighborhood. In strategizing for this year's program and working with the local builders and realtors, we determined that uh, based on the the state of the housing market in the city, that these funds would be better spent in trying to upgrade existing housing stock for this year and really kind of follow through this year and see what the housing market does and then maybe look at uh, reinstituting this under next year's program. There's just a concern that we still have available lots in Maple Park and until those are accounted for, um, we're concerned of expending a substantial amount of funds in new, new housing. So we're recommending this amendment. Any questions of Mr. Kohler? Comments? I just offer that I know council identified the housing stock as a critical priority, so I appreciate um, the efforts made to redirect some funds to the revitalization of some housing units. So that is a priority for us. So appreciate that. So. That it for the presentation? Okay, since this is a public hearing, I uh, will ask for any comments against the amendment for the 2007 HUD annual actu action plan. Anyone speaking against? Is there in speaking in favor of our 2007 HUD annual action plan amendment? Okay, anyone against? Okay, seeing none, we'll declare this public hearing closed.
And with that, we can move on to our consent agenda. Ms. Parr. Issues on the consent agenda for council consideration this evening include the approval of the city council minutes from February the 5th and February the 12th. Receive and file Board of Commission minutes from the Board of Health and Environment, December the 11th and January the 8th. Board of Library Trustees, December the 18th. Zoning Appeals Board, January the 2nd. And Park Board, January the 8th. You're being asked to confirm two personnel transactions. One is a part-time administrative assistant, Sharon Devine, and a senior account clerk, Sharon Rutherford. You're also receiving and filing an oath of office for Denise K. Hopper. Also, you're being asked to award a professional services contract to Kleingers and Associates in the amount of $53,850 for engineering services for preliminary design of a portion of Core Loop Road. And also, you're being asked to authorize the extension of a contract with Kaiser Medical Corporation in the amount of $78,000 for health care services, pharmacy, and medical supply costs to the Middletown City Jail. That concludes the consent agenda issues. I so move for approval of the issues and actions as listed on the consent agenda. Second. Any discussion or questions on it? Ms. Parr, would you call the roll, please? Mr. Becker. Yes. Ms. Ford. Yes. Ms. Scott Jones. Yes. Mr. Marconi. Yes. Mr. Mulligan. Yes. Mr. Schiavone. Yes. Mr. Armbruster. Yes. That's all I have. Okay. Thank you. That brings us to our city manager reports. Ms. Gillen. Thank you. Just a couple of uh, reports before we get to the Pioneer Cemetery presentation. To dovetail on our earlier discussion uh, regarding home ownership, the Middletown Homeownership Partnership is sponsoring two additional home buyer education classes, and they will be held on Thursday, March 20th, and Thursday, March 27th from 6 to 9 p.m. in the Middletown City Building. Completion of these classes is a requirement to apply for HUD down payment and closing cost assistance of at least $6,000 for income eligible first time purchasers. And participants can call Lifespan Inc. at 424 6888, and we will also have this information on our city website. The City of Middletown's 2008 State of Economic Development event will be held next Wednesday, February 27th from 5.30 to 7.30 at the Manchester Inn and Conference Center. The event is sponsored by Al Nyer, Inc. and will feature a presentation by Doug McNeil and will also release our 2008 State of Economic Development report during the meeting. You can RSVP to Marie Edwards at 425-7848 or information is also available on the city's website. Butler County Commissioners, the City of Middletown and Miami University Middletown are sponsoring a family science event at the Middletown Community Center on February 21st from 6 to 7.30, free refreshments. Um, as we've discussed in the last couple of work sessions, we will be trying to clear off emergency ordinances over the next couple of months. <clears throat> Given that it takes time to work through our system and to back up our schedules, uh, we do have a number of ordinances tonight for consideration by emergency. Again, we hope to back up our system over the next couple of months and council should see a difference in the near future. Um, Regarding the Pioneer Cemetery, um, we are fortunate to have passionate volunteers in our community, and Vivian Moon is one of those volunteers. She has done a great deal of work at Pioneer Cemetery over the last many years. The cemetery is a city-owned facility, and um, Mr. Don Thompson is here to make a presentation to City Council regarding the latest project, which is the Vault Project. Well, thank you very much, and good evening to everyone here. Um, would like to take a little bit of your valuable time to um, join and focus together on the crown jewel of the Middletown uh, heritage, this cemetery. Uh, it tends to be sort of an orphan and often forgotten about. Um, there are needs there that need city attention. Um, this evening, uh, in the audience is what I consider the walking encyclopedia of um, 
the Middletown Cemetery knowledge and information and Vivian Moon and, and her comrade in arms, uh, uh, Marjorie Anderson, are here. Uh, you talk about two, two people that are willing to do grunt work. These are two people. And uh, you'll see an example of that shortly in, in the slide presentation. Uh, very briefly, the points that we'd like to cover this evening, a few quick facts on the cemetery, a clear statement of the problem, consequence of inaction as well as benefits of action, um, a look at project phases that might be considered based on some preliminary quotes. Uh, it's going to require council and, and the administration to firm up these quotes. Uh, reach a comfort level on on what you feel this spec should be and uh, help move the project forward. Some su suggested sources of funds, next steps needed to try to put it in a framework of timeline that is urgent. Uh, a little bit about the citizen initiative that is already at work, primarily through the leadership of Vivian and folks like her, and then a brief conclusion. Well, let's look at the quick facts. 180 years ago, in 1827, this cemetery was originated on the 11 acres along First Avenue. 60 years ago, it became the responsibility of the city of Middletown in 1947. There are 7,000 known burials in the historic cemetery. There are over 200 veterans buried there some of which date back even to the Revolutionary War. The purpose of the vault building, which is in dire need of uh, work, originally it was to hold the coffins during the wintertime primarily until the weather was such that burial could take place. In today's current time frame, it's pretty much been used for miscellaneous storage. But it has the potential to become a, an educational resource center uh, on ancestral heritage. The problem can be stated with these three bullets. The vault building at the historic cemetery is nearing a collapsed state due to age and simply lack of maintenance. Urgent action is needed to preserve this building and resolve a growing safety issue. The third point is a little larger in context, but equally important. An effective organizational structure is simply not in place for the ongoing maintenance, preservation, and enhancement of this city-owned historic cemetery. Let's look at some pictures. This is the way the building looks today. As you look at more closely this corner section here, you can see how the water has been leaking in through the stone gutters over many years, freezing and thawing, allowing the stonework all along this corner to drastically be separating. So much so that you can even see how it's beginning to work back in this area. So this whole corner here is under decay, dramatic decay. Uh, before we go to that, could we go back to there? Here you can see even some grass blowing in here from the, from the wind probably. Enough moisture in there to germinate it. Another corner, similar situation. Drastic cracks in the stonework taking place. You can see the separation in the gutter allowing water to get in. You can also see on this corner where it's beginning to work even back into the main part of the, of the stone work. If you look at the front corner here, similar situation. These pictures were taken in, in January of this year on a frosty morning as it coincidentally turned out to be the case. But you can even see the ice crystallization, the moisture, all in this area to give you an idea of the degree of moisture that is seeping into this into this building. And again, you see um, uh, vegetation with some moss growing there due to, due to moisture present. 
Now, so much damage is taking place on the corners of this building that it's even affecting the front of the building. You can see cracks here in the middle of the building as, as the weight of the roof pushes out after the stone has been separated. Uh, it's beginning to have a major detriment damage to this building. Well, what are the, what's the consequence of inaction? It can be stated this way. Certainly the risk escalates and the bulb building collapses. This historic landmark building is lost. And if that's allowed to happen, in all likelihood, a potential positive public relations opportunity is lost. And right along with it, the real possibility of a negative public relations topic is born. Cohesiveness within the city suffers, and higher tax dollars will eventually have to be allocated if anything's going to be done with this building. Uh, we're long past ounces of prevention. Uh, we're into pounds of cure if this is going to be salvaged. Benefits of action certainly would preserve an important landmark building in the Middletown history creates opportunity for the historic cemetery to become an educational resource facility for ancestry heritage, provides an opportunity for city leadership to demonstrate unity to enable a worthy project all parties can rally around. It provides a step toward reclaiming Middletown's all-American city pride. Cohesiveness within the city can grow and it sets in motion a spirit of appreciation for Middletown's heritage. How might the project be broken down in phases? Well, based on estimates that have been received so far, and I consider these level one quotes or level one estimates, uh, looks like about $35,000 to just to do the, the rework of the stone. Shore up the walls, remove the content stored in the building, brace it up. Phase two could well be a $30,000 estimate to construct a new roof and cupola, install interior ceiling and ventilation structure, install new steel arch doors. Now the real extent of the damage and, and in this second phase uh, really can't be determined until the ceiling gets removed inside to see what kind of real damage uh, may exist there. Phase three would be more aesthetics. Install the electric phone and cable installations, the interior features of the building so it could be a functional use. Install a front patio with landscaping. These three phases would be looking at an $80,000 project total. This is not a small item. Suggested sources of funds. If the city could look at 40,000 with a 22,000 immediate need to get the stonework started, that would be a large step toward showing leadership in this effort. The Middletown Foundation has already so graciously allocated $11,000 to this project. At this point, it doesn't look like the historical society here in Middletown feels that they have funds to allocate to this process. Uh, it was hoped that another 11000 might come from them. Others can speculate uh, why they don't have money or interest in this project, but it's hopeful that, uh, that they might be able to contribute something. But if not, uh, what was originally uh, an $18,000 community fund drive would need to become more like a $29,000 community fund drive for that $80,000 project total. Timeline, the next steps that would be needed in February and March, the present time that we're in now, get that viable plan assembled, build the timeline that you're all comfortable with, commit the city funds to salvage and preserve the building, finalize the construction quotes, and issue the contracts determine the timeline for construction, but the target for the stonework really needs to be the 1st of May of this year. Get on with actually planning 
<coughs> the 60-day fundraising campaign throughout the community, establish an oversight structure for the ongoing uh, maintenance and <coughs> enhancement of the cemetery, and develop an overall 11-acre landscape master plan for it. In April and May, conduct the fundraising program with the goal of <coughs> at least 18,000 by Memorial Day of this year and any additional funds by Labor Day of this year. In September and October, the roofing and interior would need to be completed really no later than November 1st if the objective is going to be have this building not go through another winter of the kind of deterioration that's taking place. And then early in 2009, install the landscaping around the building with a target date of May 1st. And if all that could be accomplished, then everyone could join in a moment of joy on that Memorial Day weekend in, 19, in 2009 for a wonderful vault building dedication ceremony. Wouldn't that be something for all of us to enjoy? Now, the Citizens Initiative is already at work. <coughs> Contributions really have been received in, in past years from not only the Community Foundation, uh, the three local veterans associations, local businesses and industry have already contributed, and, and Brother Jim Armbruster, he, he contributed quite a bit, and we appreciate it as well as private citizens and both local and visitors. It's sort of interesting uh, to hear Vivian talk about some of these people that come to visit the cemetery from out of town and want to hand her a few dollars to help maintain it. Very interesting. <coughs> All to the benefit of the historic cemetery preservation. The results that have taken place through a lot of Vivian and others' efforts and certainly without, with much cooperation from Ginger Smith and Ron Phelps and the city staff, when they're asked to do something, they're very cooperative to do it, and we want to make sure that's recognized. But tombstones have been cleared of brush, weeds, and tree roots. Green grass has been nurtured around the tombstones. Flowers and trees have been planted. The entire front entry, as you know, with the veteran's flagpole, Planning took place. A water line was installed, certainly with city assistance. <coughs> Ongoing research to the burial records take place. That's sort of an invisible thing that takes place, but boy, there's been a lot of work done in trying to just figure out who's buried there and where they're buried. The engineering department has a lot of good records, but they need a lot of work too. The goal to ensure that Middletown's historic cemetery looks as good as possible for each Memorial Day weekend. That's what this ad hoc cemetery committee that Vivian Spears tries to do each year. And here's a really neat picture, I think. This was taken back in September as Vivian and Marjorie were well at work one September morning in the cemetery planning for the future. You talk about people that have vision and willing to roll up their sleeves. This is a fine example of it. <coughs> they have planted 1,500 daffodil and 400 iris bulbs in the side of the old fountain fish pond circle where the historic <coughs> iris garden is taking shape. They're thinking ahead, they're seeing ahead. They need you, the city leadership, all of us, the city citizens, to rally around this asset and also participate. So in conclusion, the city council's unified leadership is needed to lead the way. We need an upfront commitment of 40000 to launch this project now in March with a minimum of 2000 k needed to begin phase one to encourage a public-private partnership model with a worthy project that all groups can rally behind to reach a common goal. To preserve the cemetery vault building as part of Middletown's heritage and create an opportunity for developing an educational resource for <coughs> the 
to establish a clear organization structure to ensure that the ongoing maintenance and preservation and enhancement of this historic cemetery <coughs> takes place. Bottom line, the two key keys to success, urgency in action, and good, earnest teamwork. In conclusion, for more information, I know Vivian is most willing to accept your calls and your assistance. And if you'd like to participate in organizing the upcoming Citizen Fund Drive, just give her a call. Well, my role as the messenger has been completed, and I thank you all very much. Thank you. Any um, I just had questions? A, sir, I just had one question for you. It just, I didn't want to let you get away. <laughs> uh, good evening. Um, I appreciate your uh, presentation. It's very well done. Um, I was just curious, does this um, vault have like an official historical landmark status? Has it been... Uh, designated as such? It's my understanding that uh, there has been a historical uh, designation for the entire cemetery. The city okay. suggested that a few years ago and the hoops were going through to to uh, achieve that. I think perhaps uh, Vivian Moon could answer those kinds of questions uh, easier than better than myself. Vivian tells me it was declared historic three years ago. Okay. So, and that... I was just also wondering, and this is not to say that um, certainly this sh shouldn't be funded, I was just curious also, um, because of that status, would the cemetery uh, qualify from any, like any national funds or any, uh, any funding that way? Uh, perhaps. Probably Marty and the city staff would be more familiar. Uh, with that than, than I would be. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Other questions this evening? I don't think we were necessarily looking on action on behalf of council as a city manager uh, putting a report. Uh, the challenge we're facing as a city is we do not have funding available right now uh, to support this. Um, you know, I think it's important that we do what we can to help rally uh, and share the information as city leaders and participate in that community uh, fund fundraising effort uh, so that we can support that. Um, but it, I think we're facing kind of a critical juncture right now for the city's finances to do much more um, you know, outside our core services as a city. Uh, I don't know if anybody else has any comments or Ms. Gilliland. Uh, just a few comments. Um, as Mr. Thompson indicated, we do do quite a bit of work at the cemetery along with Vivian and in support of Vivian. Um, so I would like to recognize those in-kind services. True, it is a city facility, and it is sad that the vault is in disrepair, but we have a number of priorities in the city. I wish I could tell you that we had 40,000. I wish I could tell you we had 4,000. I wish I could tell you we had 400 to uh, give to this project. I can't tell you that right now. Um, perhaps it would be an item that you would want to consider toward the end of the year when, he, when we have a better handle on our budget. But right now we have fire stations that need repaired, police stations that need repaired, city facilities that need repaired. Uh, streets that need paving, we have a list of priorities, swimming pools that need to be open, splash pads and pools that need to be painted, I could go on and on. Um, this is a very worthwhile project and we certainly appreciate the passion of the volunteers, but um, if you're looking to me for guidance on the funding, I, I can't provide any uh, advice or you know, I can't find that pocket of money right now. Mr. I do have a question, uh, and I know it might seem off point, but let me get the answer and then I'll, I'll tell you why I'm asking. Unless the uh, sale of the um, Health and Social Service Center, is that still on track for, with the uh, consortium? We are still working on that. Uh, I am hoping that possibly the next meeting uh, we're going to be able to put some options in front of council and okay. get a better sense of where we can go with that. Okay. The reason I ask, in the um, CBDG, CBD, 
CDBG fund, I'm sorry, we just, uh, the public hearing, uh, in that budget, there's $40,000 that's allocated to the center. Um, if we sell the center, does that mean we don't need that $40,000, $40,000 to go towards the center? Marty can probably answer the question better than I, but let me try. My, my thought is no, the money would still go to provide the services that are coming from that. Mm -hmm. uh, is that correct, Marty? Is that what the money is used for? All right, the request for the $40,000 has been towards operational expenses, and we have looked at uh, the possibility <coughs> of using block grant funds for this type of a facility. And I skip through those uh, eligible and ineligible activities. General facilities that are governmentally owned for governmental services are not normally eligible for block grants unless they provide a service to low and moderate income clientele like the senior center, or the social health center. Okay. This type of a thing would not be so would not qualify. Okay. So. Marty, could Sorry. you could you speak to the fact as to if if it had if it were declared three years ago a historical site, why it would not be eligible for funding from the historical societies or other type funding? Um, I'm I really am not uh, familiar with historical types of grants. Um, because uh, we can do some research. They on are that. available, if, and especially if if it has been declared a historical site. Yeah, there are a lot of financial incentives for historical properties, but the ones I'm aware of are for businesses or tax incentives, those types of things. And this is not a, a revenue generator or an employment generator. So I, I, it's not to say that it's not out there. I'm just not aware of it. I think I'm program. just encouraging Mrs. Moon and, and the others, because while we support the effort, um, like Ms. Gilliland said and Mayor Mulligan said, you know, we, we have some serious issues we've got to address in this city this year. But I would just suggest that you look into that, especially since it has been declared a historical site. Only the building has been declared historical. But, but I think most of the the uh, the PowerPoint slides that we saw were addressing the building structure. So I think that it it might warrant looking into. You know, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> a comment in that regard. Because these two women have done a lot of work in this cemetery. They took an eyesore and made it into something beautiful, and I will commend you for that. Um, it's been forgotten for many, many years, and that's very unfortunate. Your project is very good. It's very worthwhile, and it needs to, um, it needs to somehow come about to complete um, this project. What you try to do, David, or suggest is a very wonderful idea. It's too bad it won't work. But um, <clears throat> you're trying to do it all on your own. And I think you need some guidance and some directions um, from the city since the um, cemetery is owned by the city itself and maybe get some assistance to the fact there's other foundations out there available where grants may come from to help you get this initiated and get you get this off the ground. And like I say, you're trying to do this project on your own and you don't have the resources uh, to know where to go for help for financial assistance. So maybe we can offer this to her uh, and tell her about the many foundations out there that's available where funds can come from to make this happen. Um, I would love to see it happen. Um, if it doesn't get repaired soon, it's going to be lost forever. And as far as a learning device, I can see where it would be a wonderful learning device to have kids come down and um, see this and, and see how uh, years ago where we had these very, very cold winters, and uh, even as a child, I can remember even at our Woodside Cemetery where bodies weren't able to be buried because of the uh, freezing. We used to freeze down to three foot deep uh, with our cold winter years ago when I was a kid. So anyway, uh, it's a worthwhile project. I don't want to walk away from this tonight and say we're not going to help you. I would say at this time we're going to try to assist you and try to find avenues to come up with monies for you. And that's why I'd like to see us do tonight. And I don't think, I don't think anyone is saying that you know, we're not going to assist in some way because I think we all commend your efforts as to what you've done. But, you know, we can look all over the city and see things that, that are city-owned and, and had to be foregone, Douglas Pool being one.
one of them. Um, and so, but we have to prioritize things. And so I think each of us, not speaking for anyone else, but but as a city employee, and because it is a city-owned property, we should be committed to to assisting in whatever ways we can. But when it comes to city funds right now, you, we've got to crawl out of the hole <laughs> that we're in. And, and not to say, and I think Ms. Gilliland said that towards perhaps the end of the year, once we've gotten a handle on the budget and, and address the major issues in the city, then we can look at you know, funding some other <laughs> things that would continue to, to be a, uh, aesthetically pleasing to this city. Mr. Mayor, is, um, if I did, uh, Mr. Thompson, did you say the first phase was twenty-two thousand? Was that correct? Mm -hmm. Right, the first phase was twenty-two thousand. The, the immediate need from the city would be twenty-two thousand to make up with the eleven thousand from the community foundation. So thirty-three thousand would be available to get at least the stonework phase started. Is the community foundation, obviously they feel very strongly about this project to have committed 11,000, but have they, is that contingent upon the city matching that? Do, do we know? It was my understanding from talking with Kay Wright that the community foundation committed 11,000 if the city would commit 11 and the historical society would also commit the like amount. I don't know that anyone's had the conversation with the foundation as to whether or not, um, I, I'm just seeing Dwayne in the audience, um, as to whether or not they would continue with the 11,000 should neither the city nor the... Um, I'd like to just say a couple things, um, and then I've got a thought. Um, We've owned, this is from 1827, and we've owned it since 1947. Um, yeah, I mean, it is. It, it, it's a disgrace that the, our city, we have owned a sacred cemetery, and the dead can't speak for themselves. You know, we're the voice for the dead. Sixty years with our founding fathers, uh, Doty, Stephen Vell, uh, we've got more veterans buried there, I mean Civil War veterans, than we do at Woodside. And it seems like, I understand about priorities in our city, but this is a priority also. This is our heritage, this is our founding fathers that are buried in the Middletown Historical Society. And the reason I say all this is, um, I think it, it was Mr. Becker, I think, on one of your emails that you had a suggestion, even possibly like, you know, some of our city-owned land that we have out here, and there's some different areas that, you know, why can't we find a way to get our match for, uh, you know, to match what the community foundation is you know i don't i don't think it's right for us to put all this burden on the citizens when it's our heritage and we own it if i could speak to that a little bit um and having had some history with mrs moon on uh, historical society and appreciate and saw a lot of her early efforts um you know we did um we acted as fiscal agent in the historical society for some of the early renovations and i'm um, just amazed at the progress and commitment they have and they are to be commended i think we're all in agreement there um i think you know not again speaking for the historical society having served on that board uh part of their challenge too is they are faced with some financial issues too and trying to balance uh that along with everything else uh i think it's important that we maintain you know the appearance of the cemetery to the best of our ability and i think that's the best respect we can provide um you know the building is certainly a historic and important asset to the community but i don't know that that makes you know the cemetery the cemetery i mean and i'm one that has a fine appreciation for historic structures and would like to see it remain uh, but also recognize you know we do have to live within our budget 
Um, and that, that's the balance that I think we need to do. I think our best alternative might be to uh, look to maybe the, our newly formed Finance Committee, and if they're able to, under Mr. Becker's uh, <laughs> leadership, uh, consider some of these alternatives, whether it's the excess land sale um, or other funding alternatives to maybe, you know, look to see what we can do. But, you know, I, I don't feel, you know, short of the in-kind contributions we're doing now, uh, working on the maintenance and that effort, uh, the, the, we have a whole lot more that we can do today, um, but I think we can, again, as I said, I think everybody's committed to do something for the future, uh, but it comes down to that prioritization and how we balance that. And um, I certainly appreciate the Milton Community Foundation for stepping up, uh, and I think the Historical Society is interested in supporting this effort. They recognize it's a historic asset to the community, and there's a lot of valuable history there, uh, but again, it needs to, you know, be a community-wide effort to help support that. So. You know, Mr. Mayor, the, the the still the thing that bothers me is, you know, I don't want to give the people the impression, boy, hey, that we're doing you a great big favor by doing in-kind services. No, we own the place. You know, we've got a moral obligation and a financial obligation to to you know to keep that in care and perpetual care. It's amazing after 60 years, we have no plan in place. You know, it's, it's a little bit mind-boggling. You think 60 years, our founding fathers are buried there, and it's like, you know, we're kind of, you know, we kind of got a, well, an attitude that, well, you know, it really doesn't matter. But I'm not saying, you know, I'm not trying to be negative, but, you know, I like your your thoughts, Mr. Mayor, that, you know, and, and I support that, that we need to go down a path that we need to try to do something, and it doesn't need, we don't need to pay you lip service tonight. You know, we don't want you to think you're out here all alone, because you're not. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to make one final statement regarding this, because I, I don't want anyone leaving here thinking that we're not proponents of, of what you're trying to do on behalf of the city. However, it's like living in a house, and I mean, we're, we're living in, in really tough economic times right now. And you might have a cable bill, you might have a utility bill in that house, you might have a um, phone bill, you have the house note, and all these things are part of the same house, but sometimes you have to prioritize what gets paid first. And, and that's simply all I'm saying is that right now, we, we have to prioritize what gets paid first. And I, I envision, because I've never been one to talk negatively about this city, and I try to involve myself and be a positive force in this community, but I envision a time where we'll have enough money to be able to do everything that people come to us for, even if it is a city-owned opportunity. But again, it's like, what, where do you prioritize in the house? I just wanted to comment quickly um, that I, I kind of am I'm sorry since we do own it that we can't uh, take the bulk of the responsibility for repair. I just would like to just um, propose the following as we move forward. I, I would like our, our vision for the city to be two-pronged in that we want to preserve our past and uh, move forward in the future and I think this initiative um, to the extent that we can or cannot financially support it, I, um, I, just, I just think it's just terribly important, especially, you know, we have Civil War veterans buried there, Revolutionary War veterans uh, barely buried there. I can see that if we're marketing this city, you know, certainly we're going to have our new structures and new, you know, new hospitals, new restaurants, all of our new things. But we also say, hey, you know, we do have a history here, you know. And I do think, um, like Ms. Scott Jones was saying, that there are, I am convinced that there is funding out there. I don't know if it's the federal government or who, but someone who is who would be... Um, um, I'm just not sure where it is, but people who are Civil War veterans or Revolutionary War veterans, there's, there's got to be something out there. But I'm just, I'm just sorry, to be honest, I'm sorry at this point that we, we can't do more because I just think it's terribly important. Thank you. Thank you again, Mr. Thompson, for coming down to present the information. And I uh, wish you certainly well in your efforts, and we'll do what we can to support it. So, Ms. Gilland. Uh, 
Anything else under? Um, yes, we have Mr. Mike Brock here from Children's Services to uh, make a presentation regarding the upcoming levy. Good evening, Mr. Brock. Thank you for jo joining us. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, City Council members, I appreciate you giving me the time to come on uh, behalf of the children of Butler County. Uh, I am here this evening to ask that the Middletown City Council um, endorse Issue 12, the Butler County Children's Services Levy. Um, <clears throat> just so you know, I work for Children's Services. Obviously, our Ham uh, Ham we have the Hamilton office, but I work out of a Middletown office that was opened a year ago this past November. Um, <clears throat> The levy supports all of children's services, and our Middletown office comprises roughly 48% of the um, families that our agency deals with. It does deal with 48% of those people being in and around Middletown. Um, the levy helps protect the 7,000 children each year. That's one of every 12 children in the county of, or Butler County. Uh, these children are often abused, neglected, or will find themselves involved in the court system in some other manner, um, <clears throat> or otherwise they're disadvantaged. They need some assistance. The current levy uh, proposal, it's a two mil, five year replacement levy. It will cost the owner of a $100,000 home $5.08 more per year than they are currently paying at this time. The levy provides or will provide us with 60% of the agency's total funding. I've been doing this work for a long time and it's really hard to imagine not being able to protect children and offer stable families, this, or, uh, offer families in crisis the stability they need. So I'm, I'm here on behalf of the children of Butler County asking you to support the levy. Okay. Appreciate you uh, joining us this evening okay. and presenting the information. It is very important, I think, as we uh, look at our support to children, you know, in Middletown and throughout the county, uh, that we do do support this. We had a brief uh, discussion upstairs. I don't know if there are other questions other council members have or comments you'd like to make. The only comment I'd like to make is my <clears throat> oldest son, Jimmy, works in children's services. <coughs> Actually, it's been his career, and uh, it's a very needed uh, levy that we need to pass. And uh, the stories that he tells of uh, children's abuse is absolutely incredible. And um, if you hear some of his stories, <clears throat> excuse me, it'll bring tears to your eyes and uh, how children are abused in this county. So all I can say is I'm voting for it, and I encourage everybody else to. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Armbruster. <clears throat> other comments or questions, I think, for the cost of you know the increase of five dollars and eight cents a year um, it's amazing the impact that can have on um, as mr. Brock mentioned the 7,000 uh, children uh, here in Butler County so uh, we have a resolution before us I think we can put on the legislative agenda this evening mr. Landon yes why well, that is item number eight to the legislative agenda so, any other comments Ms. Gillen anything else yes sir. yeah thank you With that, we have uh, city council comments. Uh, we'll start this evening with Mr. Schiavone. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, but no comments this evening. Thank you. Mr. Becker? I'll pass also. Ms. Ford? I just had a quick comment. I wanted to thank you, Mr. Brock, for your presentation. Um, the reason I say I was able to attend the uh, ch Children's Services Levy in Hamilton, um, and it was just, it was just mind-boggling. Like uh, Mr. Armbruster said, the abuse that um, our children um, go through, and especially I, d I was not aware that we uh, benefit from 48% of the services. So, um, you know, and of course Marcus Faisal comes to mind. Um, so I just, I just wanted to just offer my support of, of the levy. Um, I, I just think that who we are, I think in this life, you know, we can uh, do things that are maybe politically expedient, economically expedient, but I think some things in this life we do because they're just right, because it's just the right thing to do. And taking care of our children is taking care of Middletown and taking care of our future. So um, I just wanted to thank you for coming so much because this is one of these things in this life that you can do that's just right. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. 
Mr. Armbruster? I have no comments this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Scott Jones? Well, I can talk tonight, so... I can't now. Um, I have a couple of comments I'd like to make. On February 7th, I attended the uh, Butler County Health Consortium's appreciation um, event, which was a, a nice event for the community. Um, we did celebrate President's Day yesterday, and I'd just like to encourage people to always remember those who've gone before us and who have died and bled for us to be where we are. Um, on March 1st, there would be the Luella Thompson uh, Dream Center Gala um, will be at the Manchester Hotel. Marvin Lewis, who is the um, coach of the Cincinnati Bengals, will be the guest speaker there. Um, this past weekend, most of council attended the prayer breakfast um, at Second Baptist Church for the Lily Out of the Valley um, Order of the Eastern Star. So that was a very, very uh, spiritual event. And, and two last things. My condolences uh, go out to Mrs. Pat Hill, who is the wife of Sonny Hill, for the loss of her brother, and also to Gary Bargy, who sits on the um, park board for the loss of his mother. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Marconi? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this evening, we're voting on a ordinance uh, for paychecks, uh, which is a company that does payroll and um, everything related to uh, withholding and, and so forth. And I say, I say that, uh, as Mr. Murphy's going to present this this evening, and him and um, the staff here have been behind the scenes working, bringing jobs here and bringing companies. And I feel we've turned the corner. Now, think about this. When you've got a company like Paychex uh, coming to Middletown, they're relocating from, uh, I think, Blue Ash in Miamisburg. We've got PAC National, another huge company that they're bringing, what, 300, I think it's going to be close to 300 jobs. Uh, they're coming from Lebanon. You've got Ventilex coming from Westchester. Their building's being built right now in uh, the industrial part. And you've got um, Inatec, and uh, then, of course, you got Quaker Chemical. But I, sa I said all that to say this. Companies see the huge advantages of coming to Middletown. We are a major player. We're going to continue to be a major player. So that's real encouraging news. And then the only other thing I had was uh, this Thursday, uh, Mr. Armbruster and I, uh, we start back on our public safety uh, subcommittee. Um, and, you know, we want to keep the public informed uh, in light of that the citizens passed the quarter percent uh, public safety levy. Uh, this past November, and Mr. Armbruster and I want to, well, on this whole council, we want to keep the public informed on what we're doing, and th I'm looking forward to Thursday for kind of a reorganization to, you know, kind of get a grip on where we go from here and, uh, you know, kind of get an agenda together on start working on some long-range goals. So uh, we've got a lot of things happening in our city, and uh, we're, we are definitely on the upswing. So thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. A couple announcements this evening I wanted to make uh, citizens aware of. I attended the OKI Regional Transportation Board meeting uh, over the last couple months, and they're conducting some regional open houses, and this is important to us as a community because OKI controls essentially the uh, infrastructure, uh, the interstate highways and, and state highways, essentially from um, Butler County, the, their northern part, down through northern Kentucky. The, um, they're conducting these regional uh, open houses to explain their uh, 2030 uh, plan. And the one in Butler County is scheduled for Wednesday, March 5th. Uh, down at the Government Services Building in Hamilton. I think it's important for citizens to be aware that uh, the regional governments are working together uh, to address our transportation needs uh, now and in the future. And if you have an opportunity to attend, it's from 4 to 7 
Uh, there'll be representatives there for questions, and it's a fine opportunity to express your concerns as we look at uh, regional transportation issues as well as challenges we're going to be facing in the coming years. So I uh, want to make sure that uh, citizens are aware of that. Uh, additionally, a uh, couple uh, notes of recognition for uh, both the Middletown High and Fenwick High boys basketball teams. They're participating in the tournaments. Uh, best efforts uh, and certainly looking forward to see a, a long run there in the tournament. Best luck to uh, both those teams. And then also on the academic front, I wanted to recognize that the uh, Middletown High School forensic team, uh, the speech team, uh, I believe they had 30 uh, participants, uh, seven qualified for the state competition, six made it on to national, and one qualified for the national uh, speech competition. So uh, the efforts of the students uh, in the high schools are to be commended, uh, both in an athletic uh, arena as well as uh, the academic and uh, uh, speech uh, field. So I uh, appreciate their efforts there and the effort they're putting forth in the school district. So that's all I have this evening. Uh, Mr. Landon, legislation. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We have, uh, with the added item, the added resolution, which has been placed in front of the council, we have eight items of legislation this evening. Uh, items one, two, three, four, five, six, and eight are emergency measures. Those will be ordinances number 0, 2008-14-15-16-17-18-19 and resolution number R 2008-05. We need a motion to waive the charter provision. I move that the charter provision requiring reading on two separate days be suspended and the ordinance or resolution be declared an emergency measure and read one time only. Second. Ms. Parr, would you call the roll, please? Mr. Becker. Yes. Ms. Ford. Yes. Ms. Scott Jones. Yes. Mr. Marconi. Yes. Mr. Mulligan. Yes. Mr. Chavoni. Yes. Mr. Armbruster. Yes. Ordinance number 0, 2008-14, an ordinance authorizing the submission of an application for federal assistance, a consolidated plan, and a projected use of funds under Title I of the Housing and Community Development Act of 1974 as amended for program year 2008 and declaring an emergency. So move for adoption. Second. <coughs> this is the annual action plan that was uh, subject of the public Any hearing. other questions or comments on this? Yeah. Ms. Power, would you call the roll, please? Ms. Ford. Yes. Ms. Scott Jones. Yes. Mr. Marconi. Yes. Mr. Mulligan. Yes. Mr. Schiavone. Yes. Mr. Armbruster. Yes. Mr. Becker. Yes. Ordinance number 0, 2008-15, an ordinance adopting the amended 2007 annual action plan and declaring an emergency. So moved for adoption. Second. This was the subject of the other public hearing this evening. Any other questions or discussion? Is this the... Uh the money that's going to be that was that was for the new single family that's going to be used now for the existing families yes Marty for clarification I just want to make sure that uh, this will this money has no effect on the general fund that is correct okay it's on federal funds <coughs> Barbara, call the roll please Ms. Scott Jones. Yes. Mr. Marconi. Yes. Mr. Mulligan. Yes. Mr. Chavoni. Yes. Mr. Armbruster. <clears throat> yes. Yes. Backer. Yes. Ms. Ford. Yes. Ordinance number 0, 2008-16, an ordinance establishing a procedure for and authorizing an addendum to the lease of certain real property to Metro Parks of Butler County, excuse me, and declaring an emergency. So moved for adoption. Second. We have, we have Abby Eisen. Eisen. Okay. Make a brief presentation on this. Good evening. Good evening, Ms. Eisen. Um, in 1965, the city of Middletown was very, very blessed to receive 710 acres in the Elk Creek Valley. It was a gift to the city of Middletown, and we developed 300 acres of that land into what is now known as Weatherwax Golf Course. Additional land and water conservation funds developed an additional 267 acres into what is now known as Seabald Park. 
Um, the remainder of the land we did not have funds to develop in his, this was formal, formerly farmland and has been laying idle since that time. In 1992, the city of Middletown leased the 267 acres of Seabald Park to Metro Parks of Butler County. We've been very blessed and very pleased with that lease. They have maintained the park very well and taken great measures to repair and replace uh, equipment as needed. In 2007, the Butler County Metro Parks was approached by the Ohio Horseman's Council of Butler County to install what is the only bridle trails available in Butler County in Seabald Park proper, the two, part of that 267 acres that was left undeveloped um, in the upper <coughs> section of the park. Uh, and we had a meeting in January with Butler Metro Parks and myself to review the status of those trails and how the Ohio Horseman's Council of Butler County had maintained and built those trails. Um, it was agreed by all that they had done a splendid job and we were very pleased with them. At that time, the Horseman's Association uh, requested they be allowed to extend those bridle trails into the undeveloped section, which is 87 plus or minus acres, uh, into that area, which is mostly right now overrun with honeysuckle and brush. And it's, um, it's something that would be very beneficial to the citizens of Butler County. It would add another eight and a half miles to the trails out there. Uh, there's no cost to the city of Middletown, and we would be greatly adding value to the park. Um, the Butler County Metro Parks would need an addendum to the current lease in order to include that land as part of their lease. Then they would be able to uh, do the law enforcement and any uh, maintenance needs that would, would they would might incur. And uh, the staff has recommended this for approval, and Park Board has also recommended this for approval. Questions, Ms. Eisen? I'd just like to clarify this really is at no cost to the city at all, and we really Correct. benefit from our partnership with. Right. Um, and all the trails, shops. actually, very little cost to Butler Metro Parks as well. The Ohio Horseman's Council, Butler County Chapter, bills and maintains those, and they work cooperatively, cooperatively with Metro Parks of Butler County to make sure that everything is done per the proper specs and, and everything is maintained properly. Okay. When, when the lease was renewed in 2002, that was another 10-year lease? Yes, ma'am. So then it's up in 2012? Correct. We would be looking at it again for... Right. We would renegotiate that contract. Butler Metro has every intention of, of wanting to continue the lease. They're very pleased with, with this, and so have, as this is the city of Middletown. And to the best of my knowledge, everybody would want to renew that in 2012. One comment I'd like to make is uh, last year when we dedicated the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, trails that was opened up last year, we had descendants from the Seabald family there, and they were very, very pleased with what we'd done with the park, uh, Metro Park being in charge of it. Uh, the maintenance, <clears throat> they couldn't say enough uh, how um, gratified they were to, to, to see the park develop as it has been today. So, again, the descendants are very, uh, the Seabald family is very pleased with what we've been able to accomplish. <clears throat> Thank Either you. Discussion or comments? Ms. Barrett, call the roll, please. Mr. Marconi? Yes. Mr. Mulligan? Yes. Mr. Schiavone? Yes. Mr. Armbruster? Yes. Mr. Becker? Yes. Ms. Ford? Yes. Ms. Scott Jones? Yes. Ordinance number 0, 2008 1 7. An ordinance establishing a procedure for and authorizing the extension of the contract with Engineering Excellence, Inc. for HVAC service and declaring an emergency. So move for adoption. Second. Ms. Strayer. Before I give this presentation, I had a brief public service announcement that I wanted to make to you all. It was involving the, the SALT contract. Last time I was here and we talked about a SALT contract that we put in place. Um, I just wanted to make you aware of the fact that SALT is in short supply in this area. And the city of Middletown is in good shape. I've talked to Ron Phelps, who is in charge of all of that, and we're in good shape. Thanks to the city council putting in the new SALT barn that they did several years ago, we've been able to keep keep things up and running and we're in good shape. Many of the municipalities around us are not. Um, they're having a hard time getting salt because of all the snow that they've had east of us and north of us. They're having trouble delivering salt. So it's 
there is salt available. The problem is getting salt to the stockpiles that, that are in our area. So some of the communities in our area are being serviced by salt coming from other depots, which means there's a delay in getting it to them. Um, if you've seen the weather reports, we're expecting some bad weather this, this week or, or snow squalls. And as we've talked in the past, the small snow squalls take a lot of salt. I mean, they sometimes they'll take as much salt as the big snows do because you have to put it down even if there's a little bit of, of snow there. So you might anticipate some problems and you may be getting some phone calls or what have you. As I said, I think Middletown is in good shape, but the people around us are, are starting to have some problems. I'm getting lots of calls on that. So that Thanks being said, <laughs> that being said, let's go to the HVAC contract. Um, Engineering Excellence has provided the HVAC service for the Middletown City Building for the past six years. The contract was originally bid in late 2001 um, for a five-year contract that began in 2002. The contract had pricing that increased every year. Um, last year, the company agreed to, to extend the contract that we had last year and we've asked them to extend it for another year. It calls for engineering excellence to provide service for all the moving parts in the system while we maintain the capital equipment that we have, the investment that we have here. As you heard earlier tonight, our facilities maintenance supervisor, Chuck Dennis, came to the city with an extensive HVAC background. He's worked successfully with engineering excellence over the past six years, providing a good working relationship with them. Engineering Excellence recognized that we work well together and that his department has worked well with them in teamwork. And with that information and through some negotiations, they agreed to extend our contract one more year at the 2006 price that we have. So this makes three years that they have agreed to service us at the same price when five years prior to that they had continuing, continuing escalating costs. So we're requesting that emergency legislation um, be approved for this contract because it's for the 2008 calendar year. We just finished negotiations with the company and we're re already into this year. So we're requesting that, that you pass emergency legislation for this. I can't imagine that Engineering Excellence will agree to extend it one more year. That would be four years at the same price, at the 2006 price. Possibly, but I doubt very much. Um, we'll probably have to bid that. We plan to bid that at the end of this year, bring a contract to you at the end of this year for next year, so we won't have to have emergency legislation for this contract again. So we're therefore recommending that we extend this contract with Engineering Excellence of Cincinnati, Ohio, in the amount of $46,749. Any questions from Mr. Ayer? Ms. Parr, would you call the roll, please? Mr. Mulligan? Yes. Mr. Schiavone? Yes. Mr. Armbruster? Yes. Mr. Becker? Yes. Ms. Ford? Yes. Ms. Scott Jones? Yes. Mr. Marconi? Yes. Ordinance number 02008-18, an ordinance authorizing a contract with Univar USA Inc. for the purchase of hydrofluosilicic acid and declaring emergency. <laughs> so <laughs> as close as we're getting. <laughs> so move for adoption. A second. <laughs> Mr. <laughs> the water treatment plant uses hydrofluosilicic acid, better known as HFS, to fluoridate the water before it leaves the plant. This chemical is purchased annually through a swap for cooperative bid that is administered by the City of Sydney. The price of this chemical is considerably higher than last year. Last year we paid $1.65, this year we're paying $2.80 a gallon. There are several reasons for this and a lot of it boils down to simple <coughs> economics 101, supply and demand. First demand is up because several other states have now mandated fluoridation, uh, which increases the demand significantly. Another reason is that the increase another reason for the increase in price is that HFS is a byproduct of fertilizer. Now one of the major fertilizer companies went out of business this past year which decreased the supply that is available. To date the market's not been able to catch up with that that demand. Um, Two bidders responded to the bid this year with a seven cent gallon per gallon difference in price. Bonded Chemicals submitted the lowest price in the amount of $2.73. However, we have used Bonded in the past and have not been happy with the delivery that we've received with them. In fact, one year we almost ran out of the chemical, which would have created some real serious problems for Middletown. Um, we're recommending that we purchase from Univar USA Incorporated in the amount of $2.80. We have worked successfully with Univar over the past year and recommend them as the best bidder for this year's contract. There, are, there is money available to 
take care of the overage that we have this year. Part of that money is from an um, overage that we had last year in our chemical budget. Our chemical budget includes all of the chemicals that we have for that plant as one line item. Then we specifically go through those and, and delegate a certain amount of money for each different chemical that we use. When we have an overage, which an overage could result, usually results because there's been a decrease in the amount of the chemical used at the plant, and the reason that we decrease the use of chemical in the plant is based on usage. For example, if we had an extremely hot winter, you would use a lot more water, which means you would use a lot more of the chemical. So last year we had an overage of $40,000 in our chemical budget, so we're applying that $40,000 towards the overage that we have here, the additional money that we'll have to pay for the chemical that we have this year. So we're requesting emergency legislation for this since it's a required chemical in our system and the contract needs to be placed immediately for us to keep in compliance with regulations. Past procedure for us has been to once um, the new year begins, when we're ready to purchase that chemical, I bring that chemical to you and we ask for approval of that chemical at that given time. Um, next year we will not be doing that and we will not be doing that with other contracts that we have throughout the year. We will be bringing them to you as needed or as as we initiate the contract, as the contract is put into place, we will bring it to you at that point in time. So we won't have to have emergency legislation for these chemicals in the future. Um, we're working to change that procedure, so we should be ahead of that for next year. So we're recommending that we make the award to Univar in the amount of $2.80 per gallon for hydrofluosilicic acid for the, waste, for the water treatment plant. Do you have any questions? I, I did have a question. Is the entire overage going to be applied to? No. Okay. No, it will not. Only what we need. And that will be determined by the end of the year based on the amount of. So it's based on usage. Based on usage. All based on usage. And this is strictly supported by the water fund? Water fund, so correct. Not, not necessarily general fund expenditure. No, it's just the water fund. Thank you. But worst case scenario. If, you use, if, if your usage were extremely high, mm -hmm. would it all be applied at that It could point? be. It could all be applied to that. And if we run out of money, we'll come back to you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Anything else? Let's par with the color roll, please. Mr. Schiavone. Yes. Mr. Armbruster. Yes. Mr. Becker. Yes. Ms. Ford. Yes. Ms. Scott Jones. Yes. Mr. Marconi. Yes. Mr. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Ferrer. Well, let's try to keep that purchase on the consent agenda so Betsy has to pronounce that to a particular <laughs> item rather than me. Yeah. Ordinance number 02008-19, an ordinance approving an agreement with Nyer East Point 200 LLC and Paychex North America Inc. providing for the construction of a, of a facility as a development project and tax exemption pursuant to the state urban jobs and enterprise zone program and making a determination in connection therewith and declaring an emergency. So move for adoption. Second. Mr. Murphy. Mayor, members of council, um, just uh, very quick, I wanted to acknowledge uh, Tony's, uh, uh, Councilman Marconi's remarks, excuse me, uh, earlier this evening, fine. <laughs> early this evening uh, with regard to uh, some of our economic development efforts, and I just wanted to reiter reiterate, as I have in the past, that certainly that the leadership at the council level, support of city manager and, and our entire staff of uh, professionals here make my job a lot easier. It doesn't hurt to have uh, developers who, uh, who understand and want to work with you like uh, Al Nyer. We'll hear a little bit more about that here in just a minute. Um, we are <clears throat> going to be talking about the, uh, the Paychex project. Uh, it will involve um, uh, the relocation of approximately 117 jobs uh, from offices in Miamisburg and Blue Ash. Uh, the uh, project is a consolidation of their operations. Uh, we were in competition with other sites in the tri-state area. As part of the project, they will be uh, hiring an additional 14 individuals over the next three years. Uh, all told, uh, uh, payroll of about uh, $6.7 million. 5.4 of that will be, uh, will be initially with the additional uh, payroll coming on board with the additional employees. Um, excuse me, I should have said it's a $5.4 .5, million dollar payroll, a $6.7 million total project, excuse me. Um, 
the uh, because the abatement will involve payroll of more than one million dollars we will be required to share those revenues with the school district in this case it will be the franklin city school district uh, as you see, the uh, value of the incentives over the 10 years is approximately $786,000. With job commitments, the project generates uh, approximately $1.2 million over those 10 years. Uh, that includes both real property taxes and payroll taxes, income taxes. Um, it is an agreement between two parties. Uh, that's because uh, uh, Nair East Point 200 LLC, which is a uh, LLC set up by Al Nair Inc., will actually be owning the building and leasing it to Paychex. Uh, they will be constructing a 50,000 square foot building. 25,000 square feet of it will be leased to Paychex as part of this project. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Paychex, uh, uh, Councilman Marconi alluded to, they are a, uh, uh, a, a very large publicly traded company uh, with headquarters in Rochester, New York. Uh, Nair East Point LLC is a 200 LLC, is a division of Al Nair Inc., a private, privately held developer in the Cincinnati area. You see a picture of the facility, uh, a two-story uh, again, uh, the picture uh, there doesn't do it justice. It will be designed to, uh, to match very closely with the uh, uh, kind of image that the hospital has set out there, as well as the Renaissance Professional Village and the Renaissance uh, Residential Development. You may recall a CVS project. Again, we worked very closely with the developer in that case to kind of come up with the uniformity in that area. Again, uh, this, is, this building will be located on the city's uh, 30 acres as part of this deal. We will be selling uh, this first part, portion of our 30-acre parcel to uh, Al Nair Inc. at the $85,000 uh, uh, per acre acquisition cost the city had. Uh, and uh, just for your reference, this is that uh, section of our 30 acres that we applied for and received funding through the Job Ready Sites Grant that will help develop the site. Uh, this will be the first of what are proposed to be three buildings on this site. It will be a LEED certified, uh, technologically enabled building uh, that will be certainly uh, a showcase for southwestern Ohio. Uh, we uh, hope to have uh, uh, representatives of the governor's office, if not the governor himself here, for the, uh, uh, I think we talked about maybe the, uh, not the groundbreaking, but when we see the first steel going up. So we'll be sure to make sure council is... Uh, uh, well attended, I hope. <laughs> um, again, uh, with that, um, just I think it's important to point out here, um, again, Councilman Marconi's comments, I think, were, uh, deserve a little bit of elaboration. And, you know, while we are a destination where you've seen some several significant economic development projects, we have been incentivizing some of those projects. The reason that we still need to incentivize through tax abatement largely these projects is because that we still are in competition with uh, locations not only in southwestern Ohio, but in northern Kentucky and southeast Indiana, where more favorable tax structures often uh, uh, get 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 a look from companies that are that are considering the greater Cincinnati or greater Dayton region for investment. So, we hope in the very near future that the development, particularly out around the new hospital in our Renaissance district will be uh, compelling enough that we won't have to offer tax abatements. But um, this project certainly is the first of what we hope will be many, and we felt that we needed to uh, do whatever we could to make sure that project happened. So with that, staff does recommend uh, moving forward with this enterprise zone tax abatement, 75% for 10 years uh, for the Paychex uh, Nair East Point 200 LLC project. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Any questions for Mr. Bill, the, uh, the revenue sharing with the school district, that expires at the end of the 10 years, that's correct? That's correct. And they only, they, I know there's a formula, it's probably more detail than we need, but it um, does expire at the time. If we are unable to negotiate um, an agreement, we will be splitting everything above a million dollars and the, the payroll taxes on the payroll above a million right. dollars with them on a 50-50 basis. Um, additionally, this is in our TIF district, so after the 10 years, uh, those revenues will be diverted to the, the TIF fund. Again, the schools are held harmless. They will get what they would have gotten had no abatement or TIF been in place. Any questions or comments? Yeah. 
Thank you. Certainly good news. Very good news. <laughs> Ms. Parr, would call roll, please. Mr. Armbruster. Yes. Mr. Becker. Yes. Ms. Ford. Yes. Ms. Scott Jones. Yes. Mr. Marconi. Yes. Mr. Mulligan. Yes. Mr. Tavoni. Yes. Ordinance number 02008-20, an ordinance adopting the 2008 edition of the National Electric Code and amending section 1420.01 of the codified ordinances of the city. This is here for a first reading. It requires no action by council this evening. Thank you, Mr. Caller. Nice. Our uh, Division of Building Inspection is mandated by the Ohio Board of Building Standards to adopt the latest edition of certain codes as they're released. Uh, those being related to plumbing, uh, heating, ventilating, air conditioning, and tonight it's plumbing. Uh, these are released on about a three-year basis, and um, the, this replaces the 2005 code. Uh, this one is maybe a little bit different from most. Uh, this particular code, even though we're required to adopt it, is falling under some fairly heavy scrutiny of building departments all across Ohio. Building codes, and in this case electric codes, are designed to protect the health and safety of the public. And each code as adopted reflects the latest of technology and innovations in the business. But uh, sometimes there's also an added cost to adding these requirements to construction. With the distress in the current housing market, it's felt by many communities that this particular code at this particular time adds some substantial cost to construction. And that the additions to this code are not necessarily imperative for public health and safety. So we, uh, as a building division, may voice some objections to this code to the state, even while we're adopting it. And we are hoping that it will be revised and possibly come back to you within a year for readoption as a revised code. So it's a little bit different from the presentations I make as being a routine renewal. Any questions? questions, Mr. Kohler? It was electric, not plumbing. He said plumbing. Oh, I'm sorry, electric. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just giving you a hard time, but you did say plumbing. Well, thank you for <laughs> correcting. Yeah. So could we delay the passing of this until we see what happens at the state level? I would not expect a change to occur for at least a year's time, and we do have a uh, time schedule to have this adopted we have to have it in adopt. the next couple months. Okay. Yeah, thank you. And number eight. <coughs> what? Yeah. Well, we don't have to do anything, do we? No, no we don't. I told you didn't have to do anything, but I wasn't I'm paying learning. any attention. I, I, no, First three. The plumbing thing has got me all messed up now. He added item, Adam, added item of legislation this evening, resolution number R-2008-05. Uh, we may have actually skipped some resolution numbers in there, but... Because this was added on, we didn't have a chance to see what our last one was, so we know 05 is safe. A resolution endorsing issue 12, a replacement levy for the Butler County Children's Services Board, and declaring an, an emergency. So moved for adoption. Second. Any further discussion on this? We had the presentation this evening and discussion upstairs. 